piece of advice you have ever received? We asked that question on our social platforms this past week, and these were some of the responses. Pray even if you don't feel like it. That's good advice. Someone said, take a nap. How many of you need a nap this morning? Okay, I'm watching you, not during the sermon, all right? Someone said, if you're married, never go to bed angry. Always choose the higher road no matter what. Someone said, don't make the most important decisions if you're not ready to stay till the end. Don't give up because God has not given up on you. Someone else said, never compare your situation in life to others. It's good advice. We all want that. We all want tips on how to make life a little bit easier. Like, did you know if you put a wooden spoon across a boiling pot, it'll keep it from boiling over? Or if you fold and keep your bedding inside the pillowcase, it keeps it tidy, neat, and together? Like, we want good advice because we know there is a lot of bad advice out there, such as if you ever get caught sleeping on the job, slowly raise your head and and say, in Jesus' name, amen. (laughs) That's bad advice, bro. Or for parents with elementary kids, letting your elementary kids dress themselves for school every day. That's bad advice. Maybe you got some bad investment advice. Some bad dating advice. Some bad advice on how to follow Jesus. This series, Protect What Matters, is all about good advice. And for the next four weeks, we're going to hear some life-changing words. And I can say that because it's not going to be my words. It's going to be God's words. Words that are from the Bible that speak directly to to you. And by the way, just so you know, we go to the Bible every week here at Hope City because we believe the Bible gives us the best pattern for life and it tells us the truth about who Jesus is and how we can follow him. It just gives us good advice. So we're going to be examining some words as recorded in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is a wisdom book in the Old Testament that gives us many practical insights. It covers everything from learning the value of wisdom to living morally upright, to the importance of diligence and hard work, to humility, how we talk, to our relationships, to consequences of our actions, and to parental guidance. And I just want to encourage you during this month to lean into reading Proverbs. So today is April 7th. And I want to challenge you by then reading the proverb of the day. So that would be Proverbs chapter 7. Tomorrow's April 8th. You read Proverbs chapter 8. There's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. You can make, through, make it through the book in a month. And I want to say, if you're part of our daily devotionals, we're going to be leaning into Proverbs for this month ahead. Uh, and you can still sign up if you want to be a part of it at hopecity.ca slash daily. Now, in a moment, I'm going to read from chapter 4 of Proverbs, and it has a subtitle that says, A Father's Wise Advice. So a dad is giving some advice to his kid here. The father is Solomon. Solomon was the son of the famous King David in the Bible. And Solomon was the guy who wrote most of the Proverbs. The Bible tells us this about Solomon. God gave Solomon very great wisdom and understanding and knowledge as vast as the sands of the seashore. In fact, his wisdom exceeded that of all the wise men in the east and the wise men of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan, the Ezraite, and the sons of Mahal. He-man, I bet you didn't know He-man was in the Bible, <laughs> Kalkal, and Darda. So, We're getting the stage set here, and if you put it in modern times, it's like he's smarter than Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, and Bill Gates combined. We read on. His fame spread throughout all the surrounding nations. He composed some 3,000 proverbs and wrote 1,005 songs. He could speak with authority about all kinds of plants, from the great cedar of Lebanon to the tiny hyssop that grows from cracks in the wall. He could also speak about animals, birds, small creatures, and fish. And kings from every nation sent their ambassadors to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. 
AKA this dude had God-given smartness. And his advice was not only sought after, but listened to. And chapter four then begins with these words. This is what he writes. Pay attention and learn good judgment, for I'm giving you good advice. Don't turn away from my instructions. So what I'm about to tell you is good. You need to take this in. Don't turn away from it. This is going to be very helpful for you. And he's speaking from experience. Solomon was king over Israel for over 40 years in the 10th century B.C. And God massively blessed him, and he felt the removal of that blessing when he decided not to listen to his own advice. He went down a path of disobedience, and it became hard for him to stay on track with God. He focused more on running a kingdom and dividing his free time between, check this out, 700 wives and 300 mistresses. And no, I'm not making this up. This dude was distracted. And the distracted life had its impact. This is what we read. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord as God, as the heart of David, that's King David, his father had been. And here we get some insight into Solomon's fall. It stemmed from his heart, from his devotion, his focus, from whom and what his heart was devoted to. He's really a picture of God's hand on a man in blessings and the removal of that hand when one shifts your heart's devotion. And so he continues on in chapter 4, and he says this, My child, or my son, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to the words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart, for they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. And so he's setting the stage for his son to listen. And there was a need for wisdom in a world that was out of control, much like today. So pay attention. Listen carefully. Don't lose sight of what I'm about to say. Let these words pierce your heart, and they're going to bring about life and wholeness to you. Have you ever had someone say, what I'm about to tell you is the most amazing news ever? You're going to love this. You're going to want to hear this. This is going to be awesome. Maybe it was when your wife told you she was pregnant or when your kid gave you the mark they got on the exam or when your friend told you they finally found the one. That's essentially what Solomon is doing here. He's, he's setting his son up for a crescendo of words that will forever change his life. And he's saying, are you ready for some good news? Because we all know there's enough bad news out there, like the carbon tax increase this past week. That's bad news. And so what does Solomon say? What's this amazing advice and news he's given his, his boy? This is what he says. Guard your heart above all else. For it determines the course of your life. Avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. That's some good advice. Protect what matters. Your heart, your words, your eyes in your way. And the first piece of wisdom that Solomon gives us is this, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Now that line right there came from his own experience of not guarding his heart and seeing where he ended up. And it's important to understand what is meant by the word heart. In our culture, we speak of heart in two ways. The primary um, muscle of our circulatory system, and the place where our emotions are kept. In the Hebrew culture, the heart covered a much larger range of meanings. So, yes, it was linked to emotions like grief, anger, fear, joy, and peace, but it also included the source of the will and the seat of a person's conscience. It's the core of our identity. It's the real you. So elsewhere, Proverbs says this, as a face is reflected by water, so the heart reflects the real person. 
Above all else, guard the real you. Guard your core identity. That's the most important thing you can do because it will determine the course of your life. So everything we do, every action, every word, every thought is rooted in the heart. And our inward character molds our outward actions. Jesus spoke to this when he said these words, but the words you speak come from the heart. That's what defiles you. For from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. Most of us would like to assume that we are good people who occasionally do bad things. And even then we convince ourselves that our intentions are generally pure. Sin is nothing more than a problem of behavior. But Jesus, he shatters this thought by stating we do bad things because we have bad hearts. Sin is not a behavioral issue, it's a being issue. We're not righteous people who occasionally sin. We sin because we are sinners. And sin comes from the heart, and that's why we need to guard it. Now, thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his grace because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. We remembered that during communion today. That's what we celebrated last weekend at Easter. And Hope City, I just want to tell you, we had an incredible Easter Sunday across our church. That day alone, we reached over 9,200 people with the good news of Jesus. It's incredible. God is using us to reach our vision of 1% of our city. And what Jesus did on the cross is what forgives our sin and what gives us hope. You know, God speaking through the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel said it this way. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Notice God doesn't say he's going to remove our minds or our souls. It's the heart that he's going to remove and replace. Because the heart is the core of who we are. God transforms our heart to be a heart that desires the things of God. And so, friend, let me ask you, how's your heart? Or in other words, how's the real you? Is there sin in your heart? Is there an area that isn't fully surrendered to God? If there is, chances are you feel a little bit deflated or defeated, maybe even down. Chances are the course of your life is being affected. Above all else, guard your heart. And that makes sense because if you're anything like me, you get surprised how quickly your heart can switch from the best intention to the worst decision. Reflect on this past week. How many different things did your heart gravitate towards? I bet there were some really good things, and I bet there were some really bad things that you wouldn't even want to say out loud. And that's the thing about our hearts. They can so easily switch. One minute can come praises, and the next can come curses. One minute we can have patience, and the next we're full of anger. One minute we want something good for our neighbor, and the next we want them to move. Same heart. You know, I'm thankful for the great examples of people that we have in Scripture who are just like us. And so take King David, that's the father of Solomon, he said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. And from the same heart, he said, go get me Bathsheba, who is not my wife. Bring her to me. I want to be intimate with her more than I want to be obedient to God. The same heart. David had great praise in his heart, and from his heart, he had great problems. And I think we all can relate. And wisdom says, guard your heart. And that's different from what our culture says. Our culture says, follow your heart. Do whatever your heart tells you to do. Let your heart be your guide. Ultimately, our culture tells us our heart is a master to be obeyed. But that makes it a limited resource because if we do what we do on our heart, then sometimes we feel like forgiving and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we feel like turning the other cheek, and sometimes we want to hit the other cheek. And so Scripture says something quite contrary. Jeremiah, he's an Old Testament prophet, says it this way, the heart is deceitful 
above all things. The heart is not a master to be obeyed, but rather something we need to guard. And the reason for this is because Jeremiah is saying that our heart is a liar. That's why our heart can't be our leader. I actually love how Solomon takes the verbiage from Jeremiah. Yes, our heart can be deceitful above all things. And he says, so guard your heart above all things. I just want to say this. Your heart is not your enemy. I mean, from it flows the core of who you are. And many people have good hearts. Your heart is not the enemy. It just needs to be guarded. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the point of those all statements is to make sure all the bases are covered. The entirety of you should be committed to loving God, which covers all about you. It's the real you. The issue isn't recognizing that our heart can be divided at times. We all know that it can be. It's realizing what to do to keep it guarded, to keep it in the spot where it determines a good course for our life. To guard our heart, then, is a decision, not a default. We don't just follow Jesus and like that, all is well in our heart. We need to decide to do something about it. So if the heart is not an enemy to be hated or a leader to be followed, and if the heart needs to be guarded, how do you decide to guard your heart? Well, I'm going to give you two ways that you can do this. And the first one is this. Fix God's truth in your heart. So way back when God was instructing the Israelites on how to best go at life, he mentioned the following to them. He said, fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children, speaking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. He's saying you really should know and own God's Word. God's truth is found in His Word. And we keep our hearts guarded by knowing who God is and what He says as revealed through His Word. And I get it, it's basic, but it's needed. Because our hearts can be so easily strayed and swayed by the pressures of life and the world. And our hearts need to know what God says toward all things. And here's the thing about fixing God's word in our hearts. It combats the lies we so easily believe. Lies that say things like, I will never be enough. God's word says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Lies that say, my sin is too much. God's word says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive your sins. Lies that say, I'm never going to measure up. God's word says, I give you a hope and a future. Lies that say wealth brings fulfillment. God's word says the joy of the Lord is my strength. Fixing God's truth in your heart keeps you from being distracted from the things that deplete life and vitality, from chasing things that are just this endless chase. Fixing God's truth in your heart combats the lies and it protects your heart. But here's the thing. Fixing implies both knowing and and doing. You can't just know something, you have to act upon it. I want to take you to something that James, a New Testament writer, wrote. This is what he says. But don't just listen to God's word, you must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. I know eating healthy is important, but knowing and doing it are two different things. Just so you know, my kryptonite is Nutella. Like, Nutella for me is like a fifth food group. And I know it, like, it doesn't go with everything, but I sure try. And we all know we need to eat healthy, but knowing and doing are two different things. And so, friend, you can know all the scripture in the world, but if you don't do what it says, it's useless. Is there an area where God wants you to live one way 
and you aren't doing it? Fixing implies both knowing and doing. And so that's the first way to guard your heart. Fix God's truth upon your heart. The second way is this. Set your heart on things above. Paul wrote the following to Christians in a place called Coloss. He said, since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above. Now notice, you have been raised with Christ. That is past tense language. Set your hearts on things above, that is present tense. And so what Paul is telling us is our soul can be saved, which is good, which is awesome, that's past tense. When we make the best decision of our life to follow Jesus, we are saved. But our heart still needs to be set, present tense. It still needs to be guarded. It's active language, not passive It's not since you have been raised with Christ, you're all good, and you don't need to worry about anything or do anything else. Since you have been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above. Intentionally put some work into this, into the core of who you are. And to set means to position securely, to decide or settle upon. And I found one of the best ways to set our hearts on things above is through worship. Worship puts us in tune with God. It sets our sights, our minds, and our affections upon Him. The Psalms, it's a book in the middle of the Old Testament, they are filled with King David choosing to worship God during his struggles and his battles. And you want to know why? Because he's guarding his heart, guarding from fear, guarding from insecurity, guarding from defeat, from disbelief, from anxiousness. Worship always takes the focus off us and our situation and puts it where it rightfully belongs on God. When we worship, we align ourselves with who God is and who God wants us to be. We set our hearts on things above. And we so need this because as we see in Solomon's trajectory, life has a way of distracting us. It distracts us into setting our hearts on menial things. We don't just wake up and decide to follow our own whims and temptations. Those things always come from distraction. You think you're doing okay, but then something happens. Something distracts you. It could be an old temptation. It could be a situation that drives you to lose heart. You're distracted, and suddenly your heart becomes fixed on something else. Worship changes that. Because when we worship, we take the focus off ourselves and our situation, off our distractions, and we put it on God. Hope City, from the same heart come our greatest fears and insecurities and our greatest faith and sincerity. Which one you move into depends upon what you are focused on, what you set your sights upon. And here's the thing. I know, we kind of wish we could set our heart once and just be good, but life isn't like that. Every day, with every situation I face, with every encounter I have, there is a possibility that my heart will be distracted. It's kind of like a guitar. You need to tune a guitar every time you use it. In fact, you should just watch our guitar players here. They don't just tune it once and that's it for the service. They tune it between songs and after and before the service. They keep on doing it because even though the instrument stays the same, it needs to be tuned to sound good. Worship tunes your heart. It sets your heart in the right place. It puts perspective in the right place. It magnifies God and it lessens your situation. It speaks truth over your life. And like the guitar, it needs to be done consistently and regularly because every day there is the potential for your heart to get distracted. So what am I talking about? Well, I'm going to ask Pastor Brett, one of our worship pastors, to come and join me on on the stage here right now. Let's give it up for Brett. So as I said, worship sets our heart in the right place. It magnifies God and lessens my situation. And it takes the focus off me and it puts it on God. And so let me show you. Go ahead, Brad. And 
going through a trial and man let me tell you you start worshiping with that all my life God you've been faithful all my life God you've been good your perspective changes you set your heart on things above Brett give us another one and you have no rival you have no equal and now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Christ my King and what a powerful name it is and nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus I know some of you wanted to jump from your seat when he was singing that why? because you're declaring truth you're declaring who Jesus is in and over your life, no matter the situation. What you're saying is Jesus is all-powerful. And by doing this, you're setting your heart on things above. That's what worship does. Okay, one more. <laughs> Let's do it. And may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and you going and you weeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for you he is for you he is for you those words are powerful and so when you feel like a parenting failure or when your kid is going astray you worship the Lord and you pray this over your life and you pray this over your family. You take the focus off of you. You put it on God who promises he is with you, friends. Amen. You set your heart on things above. Thanks, bud. Appreciate it. Let's give it up for Brett. Hope City, you want some good advice? Advice that you can take to the bank? You want some wisdom? Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. And how do you guard it? By fixing God's truth upon your heart, which involves both knowing and doing, and by setting your heart on things above, and that involves worshiping through every situation. I'm going to ask you to stand if you're able to, and I want to pray over and for you this morning. Let's pray. God, I'm so grateful for the word that you give us that is just really good advice at how to go at life. I'm thankful that we have a guide that tells us the best way to approach everything. And so this morning... I pray over my friends here that you help every single one of them to be individuals that guard their hearts. 
God, I pray that you help us not to get distracted by the things that can distract us, but we make that intentional choice to set our sights on you. We fix your truth in our heart. And God, may we not just be knowers of your word, but help us to be doers of your word. And so may we follow you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and all our mind. Your word combats the lies. And I pray over that individual here today who's believing something that isn't true. In Jesus' name, let your word break them free of those lies. May they walk in that confidence and that assurance and in that truth. And God, I pray for these amazing people that they may set their hearts on things above. And so that just means may they worship you in and through every circumstance, every situation, every trial, every joy. May they lift the name of Jesus up and declare your truth, your providence, your power over all things and through all things. And so we want to be people who set our hearts on things above. And so give us the ability to do that no matter what we are walking through. Maybe you're joining us here today online or in person. And you don't know who Jesus is personally, but you're just saying, you know what, today, I want to make the best decision of my life, which is to follow Jesus. I believe that Jesus went to the cross, died for my sins, that he rose to offer me both life now and forevermore. And so I want to put my faith in him. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And if you're looking at taking that next step, I want to pray a prayer that just helps you put into words that next step. So why don't you pray pray along with me? Jesus, today I see my need for you and I thank you for going to the cross. I thank you for dying for my sins and the forgiveness that brings and I thank you for rising and beating death and giving me hope both now and for forever. And so today I put my trust in you, I put my faith in you, I put my belief in you and I want to make you Lord and leader of my life. I want to pattern my ways after you and so I want to live in a posture of guarding my heart so that I may know you more. And so I thank you that I have the opportunity to do this. And God, I pray for every individual, for every couple and for every family. I ask that as they go into this week, they may sense your grace, your strength, your nearness, your power. I pray that they just know, God, that you are for them and you are with them. And may they be men and women who guard their hearts in and through all things. I pray the blessing of Jesus over and for them in your powerful name, Christ. Amen. Amen. You know, if you prayed that prayer of surrendering your life to Christ, I just want to say, way to go. Super proud of you. We would love to get a digital booklet inside your hand. So if you could scan the QR code that's on the screen or in the seat back in front of you, you will receive that. And it's also a way for us to get to know you because we'd love to connect you here at Hope City. Please do that. If you want prayer about anything in your life, we're going to have a prayer team available down at your front left after the service. They would love to pray over and for you. Hope City, know this. I'm praying for you. I love you lots, and I'm cheering you on. Go have an incredible week. Go guard your heart. God bless you guys. Thanks for being in church today.